Amen? Amen. Now, the word faith in the Bible means... The word faith in the Bible simply means to be persuaded. To be in the condition where someone has won your friendship, Thayer says. When do you have faith in God? Is when He's won your friendship. So if God wants you to believe in Him, He will have to win your friendship. And how will He win your friendship? By doing things that shows you that He sees you as His friend. Amen. 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 Faith needs to persuade. Faith means to win one's favor. Faith means to gain one's goodwill. So God has come to win your favor. One of the meanings that Thaya gives faith is to tranquilize. God moet jou dart nou. Jy weet, is nie die dier is wat dart. He needs to tranquilize you with his love and his goodness. And when you are tranquilized with his love and his goodness, that you kind of lose your mind because you are seeing how good God is, how kind God is, then he has produced faith in you. Let me explain faith to you this way. About eight, nine years ago, I was there in Malmesbury, and uh, somebody came and they wanted to demonstrate the Kirby, you know these Kirby uh, vacuum cleaners? I was dear, my bro. Now the guy comes to me, I don't have any money, man. The only carpet I have in my house is as big as this red one. But he comes with a Kirby to demonstrate this thing. I got kind of tricked into it. So while he was so first I said what does the thing cost then he says you could pay it off <laughs> problem I said well I'm not willing you can pack your stuff unless you see tell me the full price right now you can't continue with your demonstration he says okay call the price I said but I, I'll have to sell my car I said, does this thing have a gearbox? Because if I, if I, I have to sell my car. How, how will I get my kids to school? I have to drive this Kirby to school, you know. And, he, and, and the guy starts to, I, I thought, this is rubbish, man. It's too expensive. Broer, I begin to man must praat. That I had to resist to buy the thing. <laughs> I mean, he was busy there, and he was talking, and he was, and then I find, you man, man. I tell you that I felt in my heart that I cannot not buy this thing. <laughs> and just before he convinced me, I said, I need to go. Because, he was bringing forth faith in me. The one who says, trust me, it's his obligation to convince the one that he wants to trust. Now, what the human heart needs, and I'm going to end off with this, and this is going to bless you, I trust it's going to bless you. What the human heart needs to be persuaded God knows very well. And I believe this is why there was an incarnation, a death, and a resurrection. Let's look at what happened in the beginning where everything went wrong. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Satan came to Eve. He said, listen, God's lying to you. And he started to spin her a story there. And then she started to doubt the integrity of of God the tree of good and evil was never beautiful to her until she doubted the integrity of God once the integrity was doubted she was now seeking for something to keep her alive and that's when she went to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which Satan said can also keep you alive she knew my only life was with God. But now a lie is told. 
It's like somebody that's very rich, getting engaged, getting engaged with a girl. He tells the girl that's working at a school, leave your job, man. I can provide for you. Look at my big farm. Look at my businesses and everything. You made. This is all for you. I share it with you. My life is your life. What does she do? She tells a friend. She shows the engagement ring. I'm engaged. She cancels her job. Isn't it? And then one of the friends gets jealous, goes to her and say, I saw him with another girl. What's the first thing that comes to her mind? I'm going to have my job today. Because I don't have a life anymore. Because he's lied. From the beginning, God promised eternal life to man. Then Satan said to man, you already have eternal life. God is just trying to trick you. And they believed the lie. They discovered their inability to live forever by their own works. They realized by their works they cannot live. They see themselves as sinners. They see themselves as separate from God. They see themselves as dying. Yet God, He doesn't change His message. He's still promising eternal life. We see that through the prophets. He promises eternal life all the time. He speaks the message of eternal life from the beginning all the time. But man cannot believe it. That's why man is always in the law. Why are we in the law? Because we know by my own works I can produce a life for me. But now God has to come and bring forth a message where He shows man that man in his sin without obeying the law and simply believing the Father can have whatsoever the Father says. Now, please give me just a, a few minutes to explain this. This is going to bless you. You remember John the Baptist when he was baptizing in the Jordan River? <clears throat> As he was baptizing in the Jordan River, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, so here's the innocent Lamb of God. But he, John is baptizing Jews, which did not take place back then, ever. Because baptism then meant that you are a heathen and a sinner, and you are now becoming a Jew waiting for the Messiah. But John is baptizing Jews, saying that Jews are as much sinners as Gentiles all in need of a Savior. So he's baptizing there in the Jordan River, the baptism of the sinner. So if you wanted to be baptized, what did you have to confess? I'm a sinner. Then Jesus came there and he walked into the water. To say what? To say I'm a sinner. But he wasn't. You know the place where they were baptizing was called Bathabara. It was the very same place where the Jews went into the promised land. Very same place. From the desert into the promised land. That was the place where when they walked in with the Ark of the Covenant, the waters dammed up. You remember that story in the Bible? And the Bible says, And the waters dammed up to a small town called Adam. So what are all those waters representing? The sin of humanity. From Adam, everything that will ever be dammed up into one place. And then Jesus walked into that darkness. Walked into that desert, into that water right there. And when he walked into that water and he was baptized, the dove came. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters again. Like in the beginning. And now God is going to recreate a fallen world in this one man. And here Jesus walks with the sin of the whole world on him. Because remember, the scapegoat. What happened to the scapegoat? You confessed the sin of the world on the scapegoat. Then he was sent into the desert. Isn't it? What happened to Jesus after his baptism? He went into the desert. 
signifying the sin of the whole world is upon him. That's why he comes to paralyzed people and say, your sins are not on you anymore. It's on me. You can stand up and walk. And he showed what took place in, 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 in the baptism. He went to the cross. The full curse, the full, full blown curse of the Lord comes on him. And what does he do there? He's got all sin. Why? Because he is promising sinners, humans that live by their own works. He's saying to them, you don't have to live by your own works. Yes, God, but I'm a sinner. I don't care. I make a promise to sinners that I can justify you with a sin-free life and a death-free life. That's the justice of God. That's the justice of the Father in the heart of Africa. I want justice. I want you to have life. I want you to have peace. But God, I'm a sinner. What proof do you have where you can convince my heart that if I believe you as a sinner, that you can justify a man full of sin? He says, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll take a man that has no sin. Then I'll put your sin on him. Then I will deal with him the way I promise I'll deal with you. But God, remember, my sin is killing me. I'm dying. I'm deeply cursed. Okay. So what I'll do is, I'll take that man, put him upon a cross. I'll show how your sin look. I will show where you are heading, which is death and sin. I'll show the curse in a human body and this Jesus will do nothing to preserve his own life. He will have no works to preserve his own life. He will just trust me. But God, I feel abandoned. Well, I will even, have, even that feeling will be upon Jesus. And then he will die. And in death, you know you can do nothing to save yourself. You've died. And God comes and he says, what man needs to see is how I will treat a man that does not have just one sin, but the sin of the whole world, and he's trusting me. I want to tell you, if you've got sin today, you can trust God. Rubbish! Rubbish! Unless you, what God is showing on Golgotha is, this is what I will do with a man that's got all curse, all sin on him, yet he trusts me to give him life. Even if he dies into the greatest death, I will raise him up without sin, without death, for, the, for God has never changed his mind. Hallelujah. And the justice of God is not defined in punishment, but the justice of God is defined in Him bringing eternal life to man. Okay, let me show you. Do you have sin? Yes. Do you do things wrong? Yes. Do you, do you always obey all those things? No. Do you feel cursed sometimes? Yes. Do you Just a normal sinner in the street, if you want to call it like that. Well, Lord, what do you have for me? Well, let me show you what I could do with someone that's worse than you. Jesus. How bad was Jesus when he became sin? I mean, as a person did nothing wrong, but the Bible says he became sin. He became sin. Sin. Sin of all people. The worst sin you can ever imagine. And not just someone else's. Your very sin was in Him. And He showed if you, a bad man full of sin, believes the Father, even until death, He will raise you up without sin, without death. The biggest question humanity has is, what if I die in my sin? And God answered in Jesus. 
Al sterf jy met de zonde, mijn broer. Als je mij vertrouw, wek ik jou op. That's why, you know what? The whole tension in my life to try and get rid of my sin is not there. It's gone. Why? Because even if I die in a sin, God has already answered me. The only prerequisite is trust me and don't try and save yourself from your own sin. By your own good works. Trust me, I will raise you up. And I'm saying, God, you've come to give us justice. I end up with reading one verse. Romans. <laughs> this is my bro. I can have the introduction gepreek. Romans 4 verse 5. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So, you're a, so you want to tell me all the way from Malmesbury that God can justify ungodly people. Oh yeah. <laughs> that is the justice of God. Because they seen as ungodly by the slave master on the farm. But they seen as sons by the father in the heart of Africa. And he says it's unjust that they work for righteousness. I've had them to share in my life and I'm taking them home. That's what happened in the resurrection. Glory to God. I promise you eternal life. Just believe me. He's shown that to be true. Even after all of humanity has sinned. And now we believe upon him and not our own works. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for your grace. I want to thank you for your mercy. I want to thank you for the opportunity that I could speak in this church. Thank you, Father, that everyone can go home <clears throat> with a touch in his heart of you, a good father, that your justice system can be defined in family logic as well. Thank you, Father, that you've come to justify us with a new life and that our justification is not measured by the law but measured by original intent. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Now, maybe you are here today and you've, you've come to a place where you say, Lord, I've tried so hard to win your favor. But I've never known that you love me. I've never known that you love me. God loves you. The word love means this. I'm speaking to those maybe you're visiting here for the first time. You've never experienced God as a God that only loves you. The word love, where the Bible says, for God to love the world, means God was so affected and excited in his mind because of your beauty and your worth. That is the meaning for love, to be excited by beauty and worth, to be excited by what communicates pleasure sensually and intellectually. You have sensually and intellectually, by your beauty and your worth, excited the mind of God to the point that he said, I'll give my son to have you. Wow. Wow. That's what he said. That's what he said. And if you have never, you know, I want to tell you this. We always say we must receive Jesus. I want to tell you he has, he has already received you. It's for you to say, today I accept that I've been accepted. And my life is not born from rejection anymore, but from acceptance. And I want to pray a prayer. If you are here in this place, and you have never come to the place where you say, where you say I live from His acceptance towards me. I want to pray with you. Right there where you are. In your heart. I know you have your own words. But let us just pray this together. Lord Jesus. 
You've accepted me. I stand innocent before you. You've always loved me. You've come to set me free from slavery. And I accept that today as the truth. You were raised from the dead. And you are Lord. Ruling over me. With your love. And your life. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Pastor Peter, thank you very much.